this uh, work that's going on currently in my group. Uh, today, I want to actually use a different approach uh, to uh, metamaterial and plasmonic optics. Uh, we had a good discussion last night with Masoud, uh, John, and uh, Fred uh, about uh, the concept that you know I, I, I like very much, and that is uh, the concept of uh, modularization, uh, parametrization, and standardization. And I'm going to tell you what I mean by that. It's interesting, if you look at the history of science and engineering, in, uh, when, when a field is a certain level of development, uh, often uh, certain abstraction, certain modularization come into play. So if we look at any field of science and engineering, and I'm going to give you five examples, uh, how the concept of modularization, parametrization, and standardization have helped a great deal to actually push that field much further along. And before we get to application of these concepts to metamaterial and plasmonic optics, I'm going to give you five examples. Of these five examples, three of them we all are very familiar with. As soon as I show the slides, you know exactly what we are talking about. The other two also we are familiar with that, but maybe less obvious. So let's start with a very, very, very well-known concept, and that is the concept of electronics. Electric, electric module or electronic modules, you know, uh, if you are in electrical engineering or if you are in any field, you know, you deal with electronics. And electronics, by the way, has seen fantastic development uh, in the 20th century and 21st century and goes on. Why? Ask yourself this question. Why is it that electronics have been so successful? In fact, we can't think about life without electronics. There are many reasons. One reason is that you can control the motion of charged particles. I mean, that's the physics behind it. You put a voltage, you have an electric field, you can control the motion of charged particle almost at will. And of course, where the charge will go, and that's what the electronics is all about. But equally importantly is the fact that we can modularize electronics. In other words, you have something that in electrical engineering we call it lumped elements. You look at this, you say, okay, this is capacitor. And they teach us, and you can do it yourself, what's the relation between voltage and current. Or this one for the inductor, or this one for the resistor. And after you know that, then whatever you want to put these two together, you don't have to go every time inside this particle. You know the relation between V and I, and you just connect them. I mean, this concept, we take it for granted. But it's one of the a very powerful concepts that has caused electronics to become so powerful. Design of electronic system. Whenever you design it, you actually go based on these connections among them. Okay, that's of course a very obvious example. Another very obvious example of modularization is concept of analog versus digital. Again, in signal processing. Now we know, for example, analog signal has a lot of information in it. You know, something is a function of time. But what do we do? We simplify that. We say, rather than knowing all these little details, why don't we look at it as zeros and ones? Now, zeros and ones are much easier, it looks that way, than just something as a function of time. Something as a function of time has a lot of information in it. Now, zeros and ones have less amount of information in it, and yet, it's very powerful. Because you simplify that, and then you use Boolean algebra and then you basically put together, and we all know that digital electronics have been so powerful in simplifying things, in removing the noise, you know, all of those things. So again, this is another example in science and engineering that, you know, simplicity helps. So we shouldn't be afraid of simplicity. Simplicity doesn't mean that it's very approximate. That doesn't mean that. It's just different way of looking at things. Another example is, uh, that we are all, you know, familiar, smartphone. Now, Steve Jobs recently passed away, uh, but one of his vision, we all know, is simplicity. Now, in fact, in computer architecture, also you do modularization. You know, when you look at your cell phone and you see an icon there, you touch it. Probably, many of us don't know what happens behind it. Of course, somebody has thought about it and designed it, that's true. 
But the fact that you have, for example, a point over here for calendar, and you touch that, doesn't mean every time you want to access your calendar, you have to write a code. No. Somebody has done it. We know what that is. And now we want to connect that. You just connect the icons conceptually in computer architecture. Now, many of you are young. But some, some of us that have been around a few more years remember that we used to write computer program with DOS. We all remember that. And what it took to bring this one to this is the concept of modularization, parametrization, and simplification, or standardization. OK, these three examples, we are very familiar. John. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, the question of digital versus analog, is, is there, of, of course, uh, the, parameter, the, the modularization of, of digital circuits is very well known, integrated circuits, et cetera. Sure, sure. But uh, is there any reason in principle why you could not have the same kind of uh, modularization and miniaturization and, and a specification of functionality with uh, operations that were analog and not digital. In other words, what what exactly is it that's fundamentally superior, or why did the digital world win over the analog world in the development of electronic technology? Excellent question. By the way, the first answer to your first part of the question is yes. You can do that in other, I mean, concepts. In fact, that's one of the things we are trying to do in optics, and we will talk about it for the rest of my, part of my talk. Uh, but, but the advantage is the following, John, is that, of course, we all know it's so obvious that Boolean algebra deals with zeros and ones. And when you have zeros and ones, whatever quantity you are dealing with, voltage, for example, current, you just need to have two values. Or not two exact values, but two ranges of values. So if you have a voltage that varies between minus, one to, minus point 0.1 to plus point 0.1, you call that zero. Or varies between you know, four to six volts, you call it one. So anything in that range becomes, you know, two numbers. So noise issue becomes very important. And when you remove the noise issue, the connection becomes much easier. That's the power, power of digital concept. And the question I'm posing is that why can't we do that? In fact, that's the one you are also posing. Why can't we do that in other things? Particularly, why can't we do that for nano optics, for metal material, for optics? Because that's also an analog system. And in principle, one of the, I mean, the crazy uh, ideas that I have is why can't we do that for quantum system? A quantum system, in some sense, is naturally digital. Like, for example, spin up, spin down. You know, automatically, actually, is digital there. So nature has given that to us. Whereas here, I mean, we artificially made this and became very successful. So let's bring these concepts together. Um, so. Well, another thing, by the way, so the other two examples I'm going to talk about before we get to really the material part of it and so on are also uh, very well known but less obvious to many of us. One is uh, Claude Shannon uh, channel capacity. You know, if we have a transmitter and we have a receiver and you would like to connect that through a noisy channel, that's basically anything we do is that. Claude, before Shannon, by the way, this problem was a very tough problem. In other words, how do you take into account the noise? What, how, but what Shannon did, parameterized the channel by a very simple formula called channel capacity. He was in the Bell Laboratory, and he did that with a very simple formula. That actually completely revolutionized the concept of channel connection and created a new field, information theory. And this is due to this parameterization that he did over here. It's amazing. You know, just one formula can actually change. Many things there. The fifth example is maybe less obvious, but it's closer to my heart. And that's the development of the concept of antennas. Now, uh, actually, I started you know, my career when I was a graduate student. You know, my professor, Professor Pappas, gave me the first problem is look at the in, uh, interaction of electromagnetic wave from geological exploration, radar system. So I, I worked actually in, in radar before I get to the nano optics that we are doing now. And in those days, you know, space shuttle, you know, had gone into space, and they had a radar system, and the radar system wanted to know, you know, how you can actually map the Earth, you know. So there's a lot of interesting problem in those days. But if you look at concept of antenna, concept of antenna goes back to 19th century. Heinrich Hertz, you know, work on antennas. Uh, Oliver Lodge, you know, uh, these giants actually work on this concept. And of course, came directly from physics. 
And in fact, there's an interesting, uh, uh, I mean, legend about the Heinrich Hertz. They ask him, Mr. Hertz, is there any application in what you do with these things? In fact, they didn't call antenna in those days, they called it aerial. And he said, absolutely not. The only reason I do that is to prove that Master Maxwell was right. <laughs> and then, of course, we all know that antenna has a lot of, lot of application. For example, in cell phone. So let me ask you this question. What did it take to bring the concept from this, which was just an intellectual curiosity, to this, that becomes absolutely, I mean, from the uh, very important concept in anything we do? Parametrization. But parametrization of what? Because antenna is not something that would be like a digital or a very simple system. That's where we are actually indebted to several giants in 20th century. Professor R.W. Peking from Harvard, Sergei Shelkonov from Bell Laboratory, Park Linton, uh, Hollane from uh, Stockholm. These uh, giants, you know, in electromagnetics, they actually introduced the concept of input impedance of an antenna. In other words, one complex number characterizing an antenna. And remember, again, simplification. Rather than looking at this monstrosity, which of course we always have to do, what Shelkonov and King said that what would happen if instead of entire thing, we just assign one number as the input impedance of that antenna, which is a complex number. And that revolutionized the concept of antenna. Why? Because knowing that number, then we can connect it to the rest of your system. Very powerful concept. And in fact, if it wasn't due to this concept, it, it's not clear how far the concept of antenna would have been developed. So all of these examples I mentioned is that the, 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 concept, the modularization is a very important issue. And why not to do that in other fields? In fact, that's what John, you were mentioning with regard to the digital aspects of this. Now, on a personal note, by the way, uh, I'm very fortunate to have the chance to actually know Professor King personally. I mean, he was the professor of my professor. So my, my thesis supervisor, Professor Pappas at Caltech, was his student. And uh, one of his early students. So in the age, they were, uh, they were close to each other. He lived until age 100. He just recently passed away, by the way. And uh, he wrote his last paper at the age 98. Single author paper about dipole antenna. I mean, what else has been left about dipole antenna? <laughs> and he did it all. I mean, in fact, it's amazing. You're, yeah, last night we were talking about, you know, the, the, the simplification in formulas. He has something, I think there maybe seven or eight books. I don't remember the exact number. Each book is really a masterpiece. I mean, it's about, you know, several hundred pages. You look at those books, full of equation and curves at the time that there was no computer. I mean, they did it with hand. I mean, this guy did all the equations with hand, all the approximation with hand, and the curves, and actually defined the field. I mean, that, that's just like handbook. I mean, you go there and you see all these curves of input impedances and so on. And then he did a lot of work on antennas in matter, you know, antennas, you know, in, in soil, antennas in the body, you know, for bioengineering, a lot of things. Shelkonov, the, uh, an amazing guy, you know, great intuition as to how, you know, some of these, you know, kinds of electromagnetics works. Beautiful. I mean, and, uh, and uh, he used to come to conferences, sitting in the front row, you know, row, you know, very, you know, uh, engaged in the discussion. Even at the age 100, the only thing that, you know, his, his health was very good. The only thing was he was losing a little bit of his, his hearing. But other than that, you know, everything was going, you know, very nicely. Great guy. Uh, so, so why can we do that, by the way? The same concept of modularization in, in optics. In order to do that, let's go back to the basic. We know that interaction of light with matter is governed by the laws of electrodynamics, both classical and quantum electrodynamics. And in fact, we already do some aspects of you know, parametrization in these fields. And we are all familiar with that, with this type of parametrization, which is the bulk properties of the material. Permittivity, permeability, conductivity, nonlinear susceptibilities, uh, chirality, and so on and so forth. So to some extent, we are already doing those uh, parametrization. And that's what any time we would like to have interaction of light with matter, we don't necessarily go to the quantum level and build from there. We actually sometimes go mostly, you know, with that bulk structure. However, in my opinion, that's not enough. We can do even more parametrization and bring it more to making these connections as we'll talk about. So, nature has given us, by the way, a lot of materials. 
periodic tables, you know, and so on. We are all very familiar with that. And these materials have certain range of parameters. Of those parameters I mentioned to you, epsilon varying between this range, mu varying between that range, and so on. But the concept of metamaterial, as we talked about two years ago over here in the same room, would give us the ability that you can design materials that would give you the range of the parameters outside the range that you know you already have in nature. But of course, physically realizable, obviously. And the way it works, of course, as you all know, and we talked about it two years ago, is that you put an inclusion over here, and, and you have a wave going through that, and that would induce electric and or magnetic dipole moments. And these inclusion, inclusion are small compared to the wavelength. And these inclusions, by the way, is mesoscale, microscale, nanoscale, depending on the, on the wavelength of interest that you have. And when you look at the combination of these dipole moments, you actually interpret that as a homogenized bulk property of the material. And that's what you have an effective epsilon, an effective mu, an effective index. So you can actually basically enlarge the nature. Uh, and you can actually put by properly putting together this parameter, you can have something that the nature may not have. Now, another interesting point is nature, by the way, makes those material based on the chemical composition that comes from atomic structures. Metamaterial makes this material based on structural compositions. Yes, Fred. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, you have to make these inclusions, mm -hmm. let's say, in the matrix. Mm -hmm. So what we have is a collective yes. uh, uh, behavior. Yeah. So the larger the number of particles, more will be close to this collective behavior. That's right. However, if you go down and down, become smaller and smaller, yes. we, are going, we are going to discretize. How do you think that exactly we right. have a limit to this? That's exactly right. In fact, one of the things we are doing, Fred, is that, I mean, if you start from this element and you can come to this bulk property, this is called homogenization, basically in this direction. But one of the things we are doing is we are going actually to internal homogenization. In other words, what would happen if I get this, this one single inclusion and I go inside and I try to see what I can put inside of this to give me that inclusion? And that's, we call it internal homogenizations. So kind of in the parlance of the particle physics, that when you start with, the, you know, for example, electron, you know, proton, nucleus, you go there, you can go the other inside. You have a gluon, quarks, and so on going down here. You can actually draw an analogy in middle material as well. So you get the inclusion and say, okay, I want to have this inclusion. What other possibilities do I have? So we go inside. What would happen instead of this inclusion, we have combination of little ones and little ones and little ones. And eventually, of course, you get to the atomic structures. A lot of possibilities there. And, uh, and in that sense, it becomes richer. That, yes. The same direction. I was just, yeah, I was just asking you, if you go to the smaller dimensions, yeah. uh, since this thing compared to the wavelength, yes. uh, a much mm -hmm. smaller than wavelength, if mm -hmm. you make them much smaller than that, right. I mean, would that still interfere or, or change the behavior of that? I mean, that's right. And, and the, the, the interesting point is that if you go down here, of course, it's small compared to the wavelength. That's a good thing. Yeah. But of course, you're much closer. So you have a lot of interesting coupling. So you can take advantage of those couplings. But for the average effect, for the, let's say, the refractive index, mm. would that still matter? Yes, yes. Actually, there are examples later on in my talk that I will show you how that actually matters. Thank you. Actually, that's a very good point. You will see that. Now, the advantage of this compared to the natural material is that these inclusions, you make them. So because you make them, you can actually control many of these things. Composition of that, densities of that, arrangements of that, you know, host medium, and so on. Now, there are advantages and disadvantages. John, I'm sorry. You were so we're picking up on this theme of, uh, of the kind of internal doping yes. of, these, of uh, each individual element of, that's making up the metamaterial. The scale of these individual elements is on the order, I su suppose. It has to be less than a wavelength, so it's, let's say, tens of nanometers, that's something right. like this. If you're talking about visible light, so, yes. So that yeah. means that each one of those elements has to be exactly alike at the level of 10 nanometers or so, or tens of nanometers, which means that you have to dope this thing. If you're going to do this artificially, you're going to have to dope it 
uniformly at that level. That's not easy to That's do. That's definitely not easy to do. But let me add something to that comment, by the way, which, in fact, I was going to uh, address that a little bit later. In nature, you know, atoms, for example, if you get hydrogen atoms, they're all identical. Yeah, yeah. That's amazing, by the way, if you think about it. I mean, hydrogen atoms are all identical. There's no, there's no tolerance there. No, there's no sure. approximation there. I mean, there are statistical mechanics. That's a different story. But every hydrogen atom is the same. Solution to Schrodinger equation. But every one of these inclusions, they don't exactly look the same. The question is, how much tolerance do we have? And that, of course, is, is with respect to the wavelength. So let's say, for example, let's make John's example. If this is 10 nanometer, and we're talking about 500 nanometer wavelength, so it's land over 50. Now, if it's not 10 nanometer, it's 11 nanometer. For some of the properties we are after, it doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. Exactly. It doesn't matter. If it's itself 10, it's 20 nanometer, of course it matters. Yeah. So it depends on the range of that. But now, but now if you take your, your, your delta L over L, or your error is, say, 150, yes. 1 over 50, and you, you apply that now to a 10 nanometer scale, yeah. now you're talking about control of that material, which is much, which is very... Exigent. Yeah, very hard to do. That's right. That's right. But again, it depends what what quantity we are after. If the quantity is a is a, a bulk index, that may not matter that much. But if the quantity is the, is the local hot field yeah. at the one point, then of course the specific location and the size matters. That's right. And uh, but in fact, if you think about it, for example, even in hydrogen atom. If the nature had given us some variation of the hydrogen atom, let's say, for example, instead of being at exactly the Bohr's radius, it was a slightly different one, some properties would stay the same. Some of them would be different, obviously, you know, as, as far as the interference is concerned. Yeah, that's right. But, but that, of course, is a completely different one. But you're right. It could be, you know, a, a variation of this. But, the, but again, John, it's everything, of course, relative. If this is 10 with respect to 500 nanometer, if it's 11 with respect to 500, maybe not that much. Um, so, so in one sense, metamaterial has some flexibility there. In another sense, of course, nature has more flexibility. In the past decade, you know, uh, many experimental groups actually developed a variety of different metamaterials. This is not an exhaustive list. This is just some sample of the things that many groups all over the world, you know, make it differently. And as you notice, actually, as the time goes on, you know, the dimension becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. You know, it started from microwave and goes to much, much, you know, tinier uh, structures that one can have. Now. You notice the parameters I mentioned to you about epsilon, mu, sigma, and so on. Uh, you can actually categorize those parameters in many different ways. Usually in physics, we categorize them in terms of group theory. You know, this different symmetry. Okay, that's a beautiful way to do that. Another way of doing that is categorize them with respect to what they relate to. One is electric phenomena like epsilon. The other one is magnetic phenomena like mu, you know, and so on. But in this slide, I would like to categorize them differently. I would like to categorize them based on the technology they have impacted, these parameters. And let me tell you what I mean by that. So let's start with the parameter conductivity. You know, we're all familiar with that, conductivity. Conductivity is really a backbone behind the field of electronics. If you really, uh, 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 I mean, we really go down to electronics, it's nothing but controlling the conductivity. That's it. I mean, if you look at a semiconductor, you want to actually control the mobilities of the electron, and that relates to conductivity. So the entire field of electronics, in, I can interpret them as a three-dimensional inhomogeneous conductivity. If, I, if you look at this, uh, this, uh, this circuit board, it's a three-dimensional distribution of conductivity. We have wires, very high conductivity. We have air, very low conductivity. We have semiconductor, medium conductivity. You know, all of those things, and you can control it. So one can say, if you really want to go far, is that this is also a metamaterial. But a metamaterial in terms of conductivity. OK. How about epsilon? Epsilon is a backbone behind the field of photonics and microwave. Index of refraction. In fact, if you look at an optical system, again, it's nothing but a three-dimensional distribution of index of refraction. A lens is nothing but a three-dimensional distribution of index of refraction. How about mu? Behind the field of magnetics. A lot of gyrotropic structure really relies on mu. 
Nonlinear susceptibility behind the field of nonlinear optics, obviously. Chirality behind the field of optical activity and stereochemistry. You know, the chemists, you know, they use that. And the list can go on. So you notice that effectively every one of these parameters developed a technology. But fortunately or unfortunately, these guys develop kind of separately from each other. Electronic on its own, photonics on its own, magnetics on its own, you know. And these are historical reason because of the dimensions, you know, and so on and so forth. So one of the things, one of the goals that I like to have is to see whether the concept of middle material, the concept of middle material, not just the middle material itself, but the concept of middle material can help us to marry all of them together. After all, they all satisfy Maxwell's equation. After all, they all have to follow quantum electrodynamics. If that's the case, why did they evolve separately? Of course, that's a historical reason. But now we know it, let's just change the history for the future. Let's just make them evolve together. Can we do that? And so let me show you one example. The one example that we have been working in my group is whether we can marry electronics with photonics and microwave. And I don't mean like an electro-optic effect. That that was it. I mean really fundamentally you go and change your mindset and say electronics and, and, and photonics actually grow together. And concept of metal material can help us to put this together and that's what we call the name of this field that we are developing, we call it metatronics. So metatronics, electronics, photonics, magnetics. So we would like to bring all of them under one umbrella, under one paradigm, we call it metatronics. But this is a two-way street. In other words, if we can come out with, 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 with exciting possibility to have elements of this metatronics, this can actually help us to go back and make new form of metamaterials. After all, metamaterials consist of those inclusions. Well, where did we get those inclusions? How do we actually come out with those inclusions? This may help us to come out with a very exciting set of inclusions that we didn't think about before. And then do that. So let's see what we mean by that. OK, let's go back to what we said before, alphabets of electronics. Now, any language has an alphabet. Electronics has its own alphabet. And what do, why do I call it alphabet? Because when you know the alphabet, then you can put them together. You can make words, you can make sentences, you can make paragraphs. But all coming from those alphabets. Electronics is no exception. If we know these alphabets, then you have infinite number of possibilities. Look at your cell phone. A lot of electronics inside of that. But in the field of photonics, alphabets have been different. For historical reasons, have been different. They have been waveguide, they have been mirror, they have been you know, diffraction, they have been scattering, they have been interference. Why? It has been different alphabet because traditionally, when they wanted to make a waveguide, the waveguide was much larger than the wavelength of light. They couldn't make, let's say 100 years ago, to have a waveguide that would be much smaller than the wavelength of light. But they could make resistor that's much less than the wavelength of in electronics. So it's just a historical reason. But now that we know nanotechnology can make elements that are much smaller than the wavelength, why do we have to stick through that path of history? For the future, let's change that path. Let's actually look at this and to see the same way that in electronics we have this lumped element, could we have nanostructures that would act as a lumped element, but in optics. Now, there's nothing magical, by the way, that we start with this. I mean, you can have another set of alphabets. The only reason that we start with this is because we are very familiar with them. And because there's a whole vast amount of knowledge already there. We don't need to reinvent the wheels. In fact, that's what Fred and I were saying last night. I mean, people in microwave, people in electronics have done tremendous amount of work in the past 100 years. A tremendous amount of ideas are there, but they have been in the microwave, they have been in electronics. If we can actually make the alphabets the same, then we can bring many of those, if not all of them, many of those into the nano-optics. I'm not saying all of them. We have to be very careful. In fact, John, we discussed that. We cannot just blindfoldedly bring that one over here. You have to actually adjust it with the proper properties there. But it will give you ideas. I'm not saying you just blindly put these two together, but they give you ideas and then you go actually test it. So, and that's what we have done. And two years ago, by the way, I taught in this room about the idea that we had started at that time, that if you have nanoparticles made of different materials, and particles much smaller than the wavelength of light, which is possible, 
then these nanoparticles actually behave as lump circuit element. Not just being interpreted as lump circuit element, they really are lump circuit element. So let's go over them. I mean, we talked about this slide two years ago on, on an earlier version of this, but we have developed that much strongly uh, these days. So if you look at this particle with the real part of epsilon positive, that becomes your nanocapacitor. And of course, we have many material with real part of epsilon positive, dielectric, oxide, almost many material. This was a challenging one. Uh, when six years ago, you know, I suggested this idea, one of the challenging part was this one. How do we have a particle that acts as an inductor? Now, in electrical engineering, they taught us that an inductor is a piece of wire that you wound up like this. Why? That was interesting. Because it gives you a voltage that has a certain phase with the current. But if I can develop the same voltage with the same phase difference with the current, different way, it would do the same thing for me, regardless of what's inside. And that's what is proposed over here. If you have a material whose real part of epsilon is negative, then that optical voltage that we develop there has a proper phase variation with the displacement current that we have there. And that proper relation is the, is the, the relation for the inductor. Um, I'd be more than happy to talk with any one of you offline if you are interested in the detail of the structures. But this we talked about two years ago, so I don't want to dwell on that. Um, but, uh, uh, but you notice that depending on the material, and of course depending on the shape and size of this, you would have uh, an equivalent of a lump circuit element at the optical frequency for the displacement current, not for the conduction current. This is a displacement current that Maxwell introduced in the 19th century. Uh, and that becomes back and helping us over here to actually define an ele element over here. Now, uh, when we introduced this concept, then we studied that, you know, theoretically, then we did uh, many, many computer simulations on this. In fact, two years ago, I presented over here many of the computer simulations we had. But I'm very happy to tell you that we have experimentally verified that. And in fact, that paper just came out last Sunday online on Nature Material that we experimentally verify that between 8 to 14 micron for the silicon nitride nanowires. And I'm going to show you the results over here. So we're very excited about it. But before I show you that, let's talk about some really numbers. After all, you know, as engineering and scientists, we have to have numbers to see that. Yes. Yeah, it's just out of curiosity. Uh, uh, you're showing that you have a like a sphere to represent the capacitor. But yeah. In, in fact, uh, but these things are, uh, and, and you try to fabricate them. They change in shape. Yes. And uh, if you do have a wave coming a certain polarization, that would also absolutely right. And I, I have a slide for that. That makes it. That's why these are stereo circuits, not a regular electronic circuit. And that's the advantage of that. That's where the difference diverges. I'm not saying a completely one-to-one -one correspondence, but this has interesting features that electronic doesn't have. And we'll see what, the, what I mean by that. So let's talk about numbers first. First, let's take a sphere, 60 nanometer. You illuminate it with a helium neon laser. You do the calculation, and calculation shows you that that has an optical, impede, optical capacitance of few attofarad. Attofarad, 10 to the minus 18. Remember that number. I come back to that in a few minutes. If you do it with the silver, that will give you few femtohenry. Again, femtohenry. Now, those of you who work in electrical engineering, you know, we're familiar with these numbers in their electronic part. Usually capacitance, picofarad. 10 to the minus 12. This is 10 to the minus 18. Six orders of magnitude smaller. Hold on to that. An inductor you buy, you know, from electronic store is nanohenry. This one is femtohenry. Six orders of magnitude smaller. Is it good to have smaller things? Now, there are several reasons that these are advantageous. Let me share with you two, maybe three of them, for the interest of time. If you have a circuit, now how many of you, by the way, are in electrical engineering? Okay. How many of you have dealt with circuits? I mean, truly dealt with circuits. Okay, very good. So circuits is much more popular than just electrical engineering. Now, in a circuit, in a regular circuit, what parameter is it that really limit the speed of a circuit. Anybody remember that? Uh, or basically time constant, which is 
in a regular circuit is RC time constant. In a, in a resonant circuit is basically inverse of the Q of the system. So if, if you have a, R, it's a simple RC circuit, R multiplied by C is the time constant, and that's what limits the speed of the circuit. So the goal to have a very fast circuit is to make RC as small as possible. In fact, that's one of the limitations we have in the chip of the computer that has gone up to about 4 gigahertz, the Intel chip. Not more than that. Why is that? Because inside this chip, you have wires next to each other. The wires next to each other creates a capacitance. That capacitance is not too small. That's the problem. That's what RC time constant is limited there. That's what they cannot go faster than 4 gigahertz. Now, look at this. Six orders of magnitude smaller than the ordinary capacitance that you can buy in the store. And for the L, the same way. So it means this circuit, by the way, is an extremely fast circuit. And I have a few slides in the middle of my talk later on, if time permits. And we actually did the calculation. And you can see that this circuit can withstand auto second signal. It can stand, by the way, one cycle an optical signal can go through this circuit without alteration. But that would be, that's fast. I mean, that's fast. One cycle of visible light can go through that. We'll talk about that later. Another thing is that if you have an LC in a circuit and you connect them together, what do you get? Those of you who work in circuit. Oscillation. Okay? So what would happen if you do the same thing over here? We are saying that we have an L and C at optical frequency. So why don't we get these guys, put it next to each other? Or better yet, why don't we make a core shell structure? Chemists do that. Naomi Hallis, you know, our good friend from Rice University, actually does, you know, this core shell structure beautifully. With the prescription, you tell her, you know, what ratio of radio you want, with the chemical processes, she can make that for you. So this, indeed, is your RLC. Not equivalent of RLC, it is your RLC that you have over here, with the advantage that if you change the ratio of radii, effectively you're changing your LNC. Now, if you look at the formula, the simple formula that you have in electronics for the resonant frequency of this RLC, what is that simple formula? Anybody remember that? 1 over square root of LC. Put these two numbers in that, you find that that omega becomes resonant frequency in the visible light. Sixth order of magnitudes, each one of them is smaller, that's what it brings the frequency in the visible domain that you have. So that means if I have something like this, it can oscillate at optical frequency. Obviously, of course, it dies out because we have lost, we have radiation. But what do we do in electronics to let this thing not die out? What do you do? You connect it with the op-amp, the amplifier. So what is the equivalent of op-amp over here? You put a gain medium. So if you put a gain medium over here, that becomes a nano laser. And indeed, by the way, that's true. Indeed, you know, the work that my good friend Misha Noginov from Norfolk State University in collaboration with Cornell and Purdue did and published in Nature about two years ago, they actually have this core shell structure that actually is laced. And that is effectively this. So basically, you have an LC oscillator, but at optical frequency, it becomes a nano laser. It doesn't need to have a long cavity that the standard laser have. Of course, it has a lot of challenges too. The gain medium has to be very high, you know, in order to compensate for the loss and so on. That's, that's of course, an engineering issue. Now, so you might say, okay, so what? Okay, yes, particle acts as a circuit. What, what good does it do? Okay. What I would like to do is to actually change your mindset about this issue. So for a moment, I would like all of you to become a circuit designer. Put yourself in the circuit designer's shoe. Ask a very simple question. How does a circuit designer design a circuit? I mean, in your cell phone, you all have circuits. Somebody has designed that. How? So let me assume I have a very simple request. I would like to design a very simple bandpass filter on the graduate homework problem. How do we do that? We go and take a look at the book, textbook, we look at the formula for the design of you know, uh, a bandpass filter. Look at this formula. You find out what RLC do you need. And then you go in the US Radio Shack, but in other parts of the world, they, you know, actually Radio Shack doesn't sell this anymore. <laughs> but uh, you go to Radio Shack, you buy these RLCs, you know, a few cents, bring it to the lab, put it together, you test it, and you compare it to the formula, and it agrees well. Those formulas have been around more than 100 years, They've been tested. The question I'd like to pose is that the same procedure 
Why can't we do the same procedure in nano-optics, in nanophotonics? Not that we have the elements. So imagine I want to have a filter, but that optical frequency is a nano-filter. I claim, and I'm going to show you we did that experimentally, I claim that you can use the same formula, approximately, of course, the same formula, and try to find out what RLC do you need in order to have that bandpass filter at optical frequency at the nanoscale. It turns out that, of course, this RLC would have different numbers. You saw a couple of them in the previous slide. But here's the difference. You don't go to Radio Shack to buy that. You go to Nano Fabrication Lab and you nanofabricate these particles. That's where your story is. That's where you do this thing. You nanofabricate, you put them next to each other, you illuminate them. It should work. And it does work, as we will show you. In fact, in some cases, you can even combine two of them together. Because one relates to real part of epsilon, the other one to imaginary part of epsilon. The material may have both of them together as you want. You can design that inclusion. That's what, Fred, you were mentioning. You can design it in order to have that circuit property you want. By the way, that's what people do in resistors. You go in electronics store, you buy the resistor with all these lines over there. Somebody had designed the graphite inside of this to give you the value you want. And by the way, even those resistors have some tolerances. Plus, minus 10%. They're not very good. That's right. That's right. Here, by the way, I'm going to come back to Ben Hur's question about the, uh, the size and shape of it. Now. So let's do that. That's what we decided to do, you know, at the beginning of our work several years ago. So, okay, let's just try to see what we can do. So if we want to design this, we just follow that prescription. If I want C, I have to have a, a nanostructure that has epsilon positive, let's say silicon nitride. If I want to have L and R, I inside a material that has real part of epsilon negative and has imaginary part, let's say silver, as an example. We put them next to each other, we illuminate this, and then we look at the two theoretical approaches first. What you see over here is the magnitude and phase of the transmission coefficient of this filter. Uh, the red one, the bl black one is a full wave solution. You just solve Maxwell's equation, exactly. Magnitude and phase. And the red one is just using that simple circuit formula. And it shows that it's a good range. By, and by the way, this is in the visible domain because we are using this material over here. The agreement is very good. Now, if you go to the UV regime, the agreement is not good. Not surprisingly, because the size of the element is not small anymore compared to UV mass. How about radiation? Matter? Good point. Radiation varies with the size. You don't have much radiation. Yes. But with uh, optical circuits, you must lose a lot of Not a lot. You're right. Not a lot. The, the reason for that is because the size is much smaller than the wavelength. You do have radiation, and that actually comes into R, the resistive part that you have over here. That can be lumped into, into that structure. By the way, just like a simple antenna, you do the same. You have a radiation resistance that because of radiation coming to play. But if you make this thing smaller and smaller, the stored energy, it becomes more than the radiative energy. That's what the regular circuit does. But of course, regular circuits have advanta advantages because that's land over 1,000. It's much, much smaller than this. I agree. This has more radiation, relatively speaking, than the other one. Yes. But that's exactly my claim. You don't have to do that. For this application, you don't want to have radiation in optics. For this application, you would like to have a local processing. So in other words, here, I want to just do the filtering for the light that goes through this waveguide. I don't want to have radiation. Yes, I'm going to have some radiation, but I want to keep it as small as possible. Yes? Uh, everything. Loss of light re is represented by resistances. Yes. If you have a UV, beside the fact that the, the size is not small. It's lossier. Absolutely. Exactly right. That's what this is the dispersion of silver that because would cause to have this one huge there. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely right. Um, but of course, this is in the visible. The experiment we did, I'm going to talk about that, is in the mid IR. So it's, it's a different thing. Yeah. Since you have uh, silicon nitride yeah. and silver right there, and so this is inside a waveguide. Yeah. yeah. The you have an impedance mismatch between those two. Right? That's exactly right. See, th that's that, you mean between these two guys yeah, or the between air between and this guy? The waveguide itself and those inclusions. That that's exactly right. right. And that's what the filter is all about. Okay. In fact, all of this impedance mismatch is taken into account through here. By the way, you also have the same thing here. 
If you didn't have these guys over here, you have a transmission line, the wave just go through. You put this guy over here, you intentionally have some reflection coming back. That's exactly what your filter should do. So you do the same thing here. You want to have an impedance mismatch because your filter, part of it reflects back, part of it go through. It, exactly, it reflects. Yeah, we'll, go, we'll get to this. Yeah. By the way, in the regular electronics, okay, that's a very good. At the end of my talk, I have some topics. If I get a chance, we'll talk about it. How to have optical isolator. In other words, you actually prevent the reflection. That's right. That's what we are working on. But that's that's a slightly different concept over here. Okay, now, uh, both uh, Fred and uh, Ben Hur, you asked about this question. Now, so far, we talk about similarity between this. But like anything in science. When you start with an analogy, at some point, the analogy stops. And of course, each one of these has its own, I mean, characteristic. This is one of the beautiful aspects of this, which I call it stereo circuit. In electronics, when you actually have L and C and R, they only have two ports, two ends. How do you connect them? Either you connect them in parallel, or you connect them in series. There's no third way. Exactly, but I mean, how? I mean, there's another question: is how, physically how can I connect them? I can address that later. But uh, uh, but the, with respect to topology, either you connect them like this or you connect them like this. But in this type of circuit, you have infinite number of possibilities. Let me tell you what I mean by that. So imagine you have a nanoparticle that has two parts. Now, for mathematical reason, we assume this is a sphere, but it doesn't have to be. So part of it, let's say epsilon negative metal, the other one dielectric. So according to our recipe, this should act as an inductor, this should act as a capacitor. But how are they connected? Are they connected in series? Are they connected in parallel? It depends how you excite them. And that goes back to your question. So if I excite them with the laser in this direction, with the electric field normal to that, this is a full wave simulation that we have shown over here, that it acts as a series element. In fact, beautifully acts as a series element. You actually follow the electric lines of force, and that's your vector D that goes through here. That's the displacement current that goes through both elements with the same uh, value. And if you look at electric field here and electric field here, you find the line integral is exactly 180 degrees out of phase. And that happens in LC in series. So these are actually LC in series. Now, if you actually illuminate it like that with the electric field parallel with that, that becomes a parallel circuit. So in this case, the optical impedance of this becomes zero. In this case, the optical impedance of this becomes infinite. Parallel series. Now, same structure without changing them. Either you rotate them or you illuminate them at a different angle. It works differently. But if you illuminate them obliquely, what do you get? You get neither, neither one of them. You get something that electronic doesn't have. And optics has it. And that becomes some combination that we call it intermediate combination. It's neither parallel nor series. It's actually an impedance value. It's a complex impedance value that you get over here that you can design by controlling the rotation of this, or you can design by actually having different sectors of this. So you have infinite number of possibilities. Now, one of the things we are doing right now with this is we call it stereo circuitry, three-dimensional circuitry. So imagine I have a nanoparticles that I put them in three-dimensional structure, like, like a Rubik's Cube. Now, if I have this one and I illuminate this direction, this may act as a bandpass filter. In this direction, become band stop filter. This direction, become low pass filter, depending on how you design it. So one combination can have a multiplicity of the functions over here. Yes. Uh. You are showing different uh, aspects and different results mm -hmm. that, let's say, that uh, increase the possibilities in the case of sure. this kind of circuits. But what is amazing to me also with, with optics and, and circuits, that in general circuits work with energy. Yeah. So all the systems need energy to That's work. right. Here in is the case two. of optics, sometimes we don't use energy, we use momentum. Yes, but so you can. But here still is energy. You're right. Okay. I see your point. But here is still energy because this is immersed in an optical field, and it does have a magnetic field. So pointing vector, all of this will, will go through. I mean, exactly what what we have in a regular circuit as well. Yeah. 
That's right. But the prism actually is much larger than the wavelength. But this is much smaller. That's the difference. I mean, so real, really, this would be an immersion of this structure in the optical field. Now, so one of the interesting points we are saying that this would be a stereo circuitry. And by the way, so far, what I've said is just a linear material. Imagine that you have nonlinearity, and we are working on that right now. If you introduce nonlinearity over here, this signal and that signal can actually mix together. And actually, we have a design for the metatronic mixer. The same way that in electronic, you have a mixer that you multiply two signal together, you can actually multiply two signal together over here at the nanoscale. Now, this is one example, by the way, that ordinarily we may not have thought about it unless we actually look at it in the system approach, in the, in the, in the, in the lumped approach that we have there. Now, this is our experiment, I promise to show you. <coughs> so what we did, we said, okay, the only reason we went into mid-IR simply because we had access to FTIR measurement capability. I mean, that was just ease of, you know. So what we did, we said, okay, let's try to actually have a two-dimensional version of this circuit. So instead of nanoparticle, we looked at the nanowires. And these nanowires we made of, and I'm going to show you the SEM pictures, uh, of uh, silicon nitride, low-stress silicon nitride nanowires. Now, why silicon nitride? Because silicon nitride has a resonance around uh, 11 micron. And when you have a resonance for the epsilon, the real part of epsilon comes below zero, becomes negative. That's what we wanted, because we wanted that to act as a real part of epsilon negative, which gives us an inductance. Now, and also is lossy, okay? That means you have a resistance. And then for the capacitance, we designed this air gap. Now, right now what we are doing, we are actually doing another set of experiment to fill the gap with other dielectrics, so you can control that. But our experiment was for the air gap. So what we did over here is that these dimensions are very, very, very small compared to the wavelength. In fact, the dimensions are this. So we built nine samples. And these nine samples, you know, have three different heights, you know. And remember, because we are interested in 8 to 14 micron, these are much, much smaller wavelength. That's good. And this W, three different Ws. So we have for each one of these, three or different of these. So we have nine different samples of this. Now, According to uh, our theory, I promise you, we're going to use a simple formula. And that's exactly the formula you have is in, in the circuit textbook, which is the impedance is 1 over minus i omega c. That's what it is. That's exactly what it is. It's the dimension. This is the epsilon of silicon nitride you put over here. Of course, this epsilon is a function of frequency itself. That's true. Very simple formula. From that, you find the parallel uh, impedance. From that, you find the transmission going through the system. So if we are right, when we do the experiment and we compare it with this transmittance to see how close these guys are, and in that direction, by the way, of course, it's infinite because uh, it's two-dimensional structure. So according to what we have, let me just show you this. According to what we have, this should act in that range of wavelength. This should act as an inductor parallel with the resistor. This should act as a capacitor for this polarization. For the other polarization, it should be series. So let's see. Then we build this. And it took us about one and a half years, by the way, to build this. It was a very tough nanofabrication because it was a combination of e-beam lithography and photolithography. And the challenge over here is we wanted these nanowires to be suspended. We didn't want this nanowire to be over any substrate. So what you do, you start with the silicon substrate, with the layer of silicon nitride on top of it. So then with e-beam, you etch this. But that was relatively easy part. The tough part is how to etch it from below and from above, and from below you etch it until it comes to the wires and stop. That was a challenging part. Sometimes we stop early, you had a layer of that. Sometimes you stop late, the wires broke. I mean, and it took us one and a half years. Finally, we did it. And the reason we wanted to have suspended because I wanted to directly show that this is lump circuit element. I didn't want to have a combination of lump circuit over substrate. The substrate is another part of the circuit. You can do that. But I wanted just to show a pure comparison that we have over here. So we did it, and these are AFM and the SEM picture that you have over here. The dimensions is similar to the dimension I mentioned that to you. And then we put in the FTIR, we illuminate it with the, uh, with the mid IR signal. When the electric field is parallel with that, this should be what it should be. I mean, we're going to see. And when it's perpendicular to that, it should be like this. So let's look at the result. And these are things. 54 curves you see over here. Nine samples, each one of them, with two different polarization that we have. That becomes 18 different uh, experimental setup. 
And here you see 54 curves. So for every case of those 18, we show three curves over here. One of them, experimental result. The other one, direct solving Maxwell's equation. And the third one, directly using the simple circuit form. And all three agree. In fact, every color of this you choose is one case. So for example, let's look at this case. There are three curves over here. Another sample, three curves over here. Another sample, three curves over here. This would be in parallel circuit. This would be the series circuit. And beautiful aspects that's really exciting to me is that just like a regular RLC, you could actually design the resonance. So as you change different sample, the different width would give you different L. The different L and different C would give you different omega. So the, the dip of the band stop will move. I'm sorry? Exactly. And there is an another frequency. You see this one happened here and happened here happened here. So you can actually design. And that becomes your circuit. So indeed, these nanowires are lump circuit in the mid-wire. So we were very, very excited. And uh, we were excited that just came out you know, last week. Right now, what we are doing, we are extending this into near IR. And in near IR, we use different material. We use a transparent conducting oxide. Specifically, we are using indium tin oxide. And indium tin oxide has a very interesting property. It's a plasmonic material that is epsilon crosses zero at about 1.2 micron. And remember, silicon nitride crosses at around 10 point micron, so about 1.2 micron. And uh, so here I'm showing you the comparison of experiment, which is a solid curve, and the, and the dashed curve, which is the theory curve. Over here, you see agreement is pretty good. This is our preliminary results that we are getting for this. Look at the dimensions. Dimensions uh, with respect to uh, 1.5 micron is pretty good. So this is what we have over here. And this is basically the parallel circuits we have over here. But this time with indium tin oxide in the near IR. 10 times smaller wavelength. And one of the things we are planning to do, and we are working on it, this is just a concept here, is that this becomes, remember I mentioned to you in the earlier slide that if I have this circuit element, then that becomes my building block. So I can put them next to each other, and that becomes the inclusion of a new type of metal material that I can design, so I can actually design filter metal material in any range of frequency you want. So if this is one building block, I can make another one, I can make another one, I can make another one, I can have a stack of this, exactly following the circuit concept that we have over here. And this is, this is a simulation. This is not experiment yet. So just like filter, if you have a simple filter, you have certain slope of this. What would happen if you have two of them cascade? It slopes faster. How about three of them slope faster? Exactly like this happened. Look at this. So you put these layers next to each other. You get a sharper and sharper filter that you have there. Yeah, exactly. So you get. So look at this. This is for the series case. Uh, I mean, this, this is for the transmittance. This is for the reflectance for this case that we have. And these are the dimensions. Uh, this one, we are planning to do experiment. We haven't done the experiment on this stack yet. And then you can have other interesting point. Now, this is the stereo part. So you can have a filter like this for this polarization. You can have a filter like this for that polarization. You can have a filter like this for the oblique one. You can have, so you can actually put that and create material. And here, it's very interesting. For this, the filter. It's band, band stop filter. For this one, it's the band pass filter. You put them together, you get a combination over here. And the combination is almost like multiplication of two filters, almost. Of course, there's some inner coupling. But look at this. If we just do the multiplication, you get this curve. A complete full wave simulation, you get this curve. Very similar to that. So this actually would help us to actually come out with this design. And of course, we have to test it. But that will be the starting point. Then you can actually have each one of them with different things. So you can have one with a different resonant frequency, another layer with another different. So you really can manipulate the nature. In nature, the, the, the atoms and electrons come more similar here. Intentionally, we want to have differently. So you can actually have different. So this layer had this band stop. This one has this band stop. We put them together, we'll have this band stop. So you can actually design this guy. OK. Now, moving along, I don't have time to talk about how we can, uh, we can have an equivalent of wires. We have done this before. Metamaterial come to help us with the epsilon near zero background. You can actually cut the grooves. When you cut the grooves, you can actually control vector D in the direction you want at the optical frequency. So you can have a D dot wire. This we talked about you know, two years ago, that you know, regular wires would be for conduction current. 
Uh, this type of D dot wire is for displacement current. We experimentally verified that in the microwave frequency. Again, I don't have time to go through this, but we created a waveguide with a special type of dispersion, and we showed that you have a, this wavy line. The vector E actually follows this thing quite nicely, so that becomes actually a displacement current wire. Now, just to let you know it, that this total length is eight times free space wavelength. So this is like a capacitor that you open up the capacitor eight times, and still the vector D is confined. And that becomes wire, but the wire for displacement current. Uh, so with this tool, we can go from domain to domain. Let's go into electronic, find out what we have done there, bring some of them into the nanophotonics. In electronics, we have filter. We already talked about it. Now you have metatronic filter that we showed over here. In electronics, we have antennas. We talk about that. Now we have nano antennas. Now, nano antennas, you know, if you have a two silver nanoparticle, it becomes a dimer antenna. And you have a parallel uh, uh, metal insulator metal, you have a plasmonic waveguide. If you connect these two guys together, the connection is very poor. Not that much energy interact between them. Why? Because they have different impedances. I mean, I mean, in physics, we don't want to talk about impedance. But the fact of the matter is they have different impedances. Well, we have the same problem in microwave. If you connect a transmission line to a small antenna, you have different impedances. How do we solve them? We match them. We have a matching network. Why can't we do the same thing over here? Here, the matching network is just one nanoparticle. You put one nanoparticle over here, you match the transmission line with this. And this is simulation. You see how nicely the wave comes over here and come out. Now, how, if we didn't have the lumped circuit element, we couldn't have thought about this point. So this becomes actually that lumped element. You put it there, and you match the antenna. And you can do it over here. Now, how about wireless link? One of the things we did in the past two years since last time I was here is that we developed this concept. In microwave, when we want to communicate, we use wirelessly. Can anybody tell me why? Why not we just con uh, connect point A to point B by wire? Well, but cell phone, because we want to connect it in many things. But let me assume I, I, I'm in point A, and I want to connect to point B. Uh, let me assume even not mobility. Uh, that's right. That's the advantage of this. But at point A, I want to connect to point B. I, I can either send it by wireless signal, or I can connect it by wire. Which one is advantageous? I, I asked that question to my class. Which one is advantageous? To connect it by wire, or connect it by wireless? Yes. Tell me. You have an you have answer? Wire. Wire. Why? Less lossy. Less lossy. Excellent point. But I tell my students this. <coughs> An antenna, how does the power of the antenna drop as a function of distance? Does anybody remember that? One, well, 1 over r squared. Electric field is 1 over r. 1 over r squared. 1 over r squared, think about it. 1 over r squared, is a, it seems to be a, a lot waste of energy. 1 over r squared, it's a lot of decay. And then I tell my student, look at the space voyager that goes at the edge of the solar system has an antenna, which is not too big, send the signal, what is that distance? At the edge of the solar system to here, put that 1 over r squared there. The signal you get over here is extremely weak. And still we use an antenna, and still we are able to get that out of the noise. And that's amazing, by the way. It still amazes me. And you know, with all the noises that we have here on Earth, we can still pick up that noise, that signal that's coming from the space voyager over here. Of course, that's because we have a correlator. That's a different story. But the, but the signal is there. So still, 1 over r squared, we use antenna. But you said wire. Yes, wire is a good, good answer. But wire has its own problem. You also have loss there. But in a transmission line, loss is affected by e to the minus alpha distance. is exponential. Exponential eventually will lose, depending how far you are. So as you increase the distance, there is a crossing point. Beyond that, 1 over r squared is advantageous to e to the minus alpha r. So of course, depend on, on the loss. You're right. If your transmission line is absolutely lossless, the transmission line wins. But of course, we can't take the transmission line between here and moon. 
So obviously we have to, that's a mobility issue. So antenna always wins. So if that's the case, let's bring this concept into nanoscale. So let's say I'm inside the chip and I want to connect optical signal from one part of the chip to another, point A to point B. Which one is better? Can I connect it with plasmonic waveguide? Well, it has its own loss, exponential loss. How about if I cut short the transmission line, put a little antenna over here, cut short that one, put a little antenna over here, have a transmitting nano antenna, receiving nano antenna, and just let the optical signal go in air. It has one over R squared, that's true, but that one over R squared wins. But the key point over here is to match the antenna. If you don't match the antenna, you're not going to win that much. And we did, we did that in our, in our concept. And uh, so my good friend Harold Gissen from uh, Stuttgart now is very interested to do, try to do this experimentally. We'll see. Uh -huh. okay. but, uh, but this concept shows that indeed this could be a wireless communication within a chip that you have, yes. What about uh, channel capacity? Or uh, if you compare the transmission line, a yes. wire transmission line, mm. uh, against wireless, yes. the, yep. the, the, uh, the speed of information that can be transmitted from one to the other, how do they compare? Excellent. We haven't done that calculation. That's a great question. My guess, this is just purely my guess, that still the wireless could be advantageous because the dispersion is much less. In plasmonic waveguide, you have a lot of dispersion. So you can't send that much bandwidth yeah. within that. So I'm, I'm hoping, I don't know this for a fact, I'm hoping for the antenna would be better. But I don't know that. Yeah. It doesn't have to be. That's right. The only reason I'm saying it's plasmonic is because it's soft wavelength in, in the confinement. If you use regular optical fiber, it's much better. Because Absolutely right. You can do that. Uh, yes. I mean, the reason that we're comparing it with plasmonic is simply because of the confinement. If you get a regular optical fiber and you make it a few nanometers, the field is not that confined. Exactly. So that might have its own, you know, I mean, loss. But you're right. I mean, you, there are other you ways. Can get, you, can, you can make structures with surface waves which have, the conf have confinement. And yes, basically but... Basically, these are one-dimensional waveguides. Sure. But, but, the, but the thing is, if you do it with metal, that becomes plasmonic, but there's loss. If you do it with dielectric, the minimum size you can get is land over 2N. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, that, that's the, confi the best confinement you can get with dielectric is land over 2N. Yes, yeah. that's true. Yeah. Uh, Fast response. Is this circuit fast? I promise to show you this. So if I to look at the regular RC circuit, of course, you said the pulse like this, it becomes like this. That's one of the reasons we have a bottleneck in this speed. And of course, we all know, we teach that in circuit course, that this is RC time constant. Okay. If you have a filter, uh, then it depends. If you send a signal like this, it becomes like this. And this delay or this basically I mean, slowing down of the rise time, it also depends on the Q of the system. So the Q of the system goes like something like this. And take a look at this one, and you notice this becomes basically the bandwidth that you have over here. The question is this guy. So it, if you want to have a fast circuit, you better have delta omega large. Q low. You have to have that. So because whatever this delta omega is, that will give you the rise time of the signal. So if I want to actually send a digital pulse to this circuit, because remember, one of my ideas is to make things also digital, I have to make sure when it comes out of this circuit, it actually uh, uh, faithfully follows the rise time. Otherwise, I cannot send many of them back in the row. So this rise time is very important, and that relates to this delta omega. So let's just take a very, very, very simple geometry. A simple, thin layer of dielectric. A simple layer of thin dielectric, if I send a pulse like this, what do I get to the other side of it? Now, if simple layer of dielectric, according to what we talk about, is a capacitor. And this in a resistor is basically air over here. It's a free space that you have there. So what is the RC time constant of this very, very simple geometry? OK, if this 20 nanometer, epsilon, let's say 3, the C of this structure is half an octofarad. R is 377 ohm, time constant 200 out to second. So if I have one cycle of a femtosecond pulse, let's say 750, it, it can go outside of this. And it does. So this is the magnitude of transmission coefficient, almost flat. Phase of that, almost flat. 
So we tried that. We send this pulse, you know, uh, in our simulation, you get this thing back, almost the same. The only difference is that the height is different than the other one. So very good. So you can use it as a filter, but the pulse doesn't change that much. So this is not a very high Q filter. In fact, you don't want to have it high Q. You want to have it very low Q because you would like to have a very fast circuit. So let's make it a little bit fun. So um, how about if we have it plasmonic? So let me assume this is, for example, metal instead of dielectric. This metal, this becomes, you know, uh, the epsilon through there. And if you go through this one, and then the L becomes 62 femto Henry. And then if you use the time constant, 165 auto second, the same thing. So this one, you notice, by the way, one thing I forgot to mention, this looks like a low pass filter. This looks like a high pass filter. Why? Because this is inductor. Exactly right. I mean, if you have a, uh, this is nothing surprising. If I have a piece of metal over here, that is my high pass filter. Look. So I do this, and I almost get the same. There's more distortion over here, but the width is almost the same as this one. How about if we put them together? If you put them together, you have a Q of 1, extremely low Q. That's not a bad thing, because then the bandwidth is the same as omega 0. This is extremely high bandwidth circuit extremely high bandwidth circuit. That's why this pulse will go through. But will go through with a different height. So you can actually control the height of the pulse, but the width of it will go through. So you can have it very nicely in the digital system. So then you can have a lot of fun. Then you can have in series, in that case, you have a band stop filter. And band stop filter, of course, is narrower. Band over here, you notice this a little bit ringing over here. So it's not as completely going through. Now, then, Let's put them together. So if you have a, uh, this layer, you have some pulse going through. Now, this is interesting, by the way. It's obvious to all of you in plasmonics. But the people in circuit is also obvious, but for different reason. If you have a layer of uh, metal over here, and you send the signal through it, only part of it would go to the other side. Now, if you get that metal, and you add dielectric on its surface, more signal will go through. At first, it's counterintuitive. But from circuit point of view, it does make sense. Because if I have an L, it's something. But if I have L and C, it goes into resonance. And the things will go through. And that's what actually happens in optics, too. And it doesn't matter the order of these guys for the thin layers. I'm sorry, somebody? Uh, kind of, kind of. But of course, not exactly. Because inside the metal, in principle, you don't have any propagation. Because epsilon is negative, but not mu. But it's very, very thin. So the, that, that evanescent will show up to the other side, but we can. But if you put a dielectric this side or that side of it, it goes approximately into resonance. So it becomes like LC in parallel. The things will suck in into that. Effectively, you can say kind of like anti-reflection coding. But, the, but, but what goes through is not exactly one, by the way. It's slightly lower. Here, if, I, if you take a look at it, you notice by itself, it was a high pass filter. You put this guy there, the transfer function becomes slightly larger. And by the way, this uh, uh, green that you see over here is green and red for this case and this case, but exactly on top of each other. So it doesn't matter if you actually change the order. Yes. Exactly. Body plot. That's exactly right. Uh, last night I was telling you about. That's exactly body plot. Yes. So you can do it in optics. Yeah. That's right. Then you can have a lot of fun. So in circuit, we already do this. You get these guys together. You can actually control the temporal. I mean, the history of a pulse that you send through many layers of filters. Why not to do it in optics? You can do the same thing over here. Put different layers of that. Each one of them you can control. And then you can get what you want over here. Or you can have a lot of fun things. You can put you know, different filters over here. And you can actually have a different time delay. Because filter can also work with a time delay. You can actually do something like this. So you can temporarily control the signal that's going through. So in metatronics, we have an interesting paradigm. We have a paradigm that by putting this nanoparticle next to each other, you can imitate some of the things that the people in electronics have been doing, but even richer. Because you have a combination of polarization. You have a combination of direction of propagation that in electronics we don't have. And uh, as I promised you, metatronics uh, uh, helps us to, I mean, metamaterial help us to build the field of metatronics. Now metatronics can help us to come up with the exotic form of metamaterials. For example, did I tell you this guy over here? If you look at metamaterial, people often talk about split ring resonator. 
which is basically an LC circuit. Okay, that's not a big deal. But why do we have to stock only to one LC circuit? Why not to come out with this as a building block? So how about if you do this? So if, how about if we can have a material that each one of these would have something like that? Effectively, that reminds me, by the way, of a more complex atomic structure. I mean, we start with a hydrogen atom, and then we have, you know, much heavier, I mean, atomic structure over here that has much more, you know, molecular structure. The same thing we're doing over here by having different type of resonances, making the building block. Actually, by the way, if you look at atomic structure, what really matters there from optics point of view is the absorption lines. That's what we're trying to do over here. So you're creating your desired absorption line in the inclusion you want. And you put them next to each other, and that becomes a new form of metamaterial. So, uh, so far, I've talked to you about the linear systems. But in my group, we are actually working heavily on nonlinearity as well. For example, here, we introduce nonlinearity in this structure. We have a mixer I, that we have. Right now, we are working, actually, with a structure that has three-port network with the hope of actually developing a transistor for this structure. Because we need to have a three-port network if we want to do switching, if we want to do uh, processing. And that's what we do. And here, we have a couple of designs for this transistor. We haven't published that yet because we're trying to check you know, everything to make sure that's the case. So in this case, this, kind, this would be a kind of transistor that works with the displacement current right in the flow of electrons directly works with the chart, with the, with the field, yes. I have a question regarding this uh, waveguide describe this one, yeah. that you have there. And they have the inclusions. Uh, yeah. My curiosity is uh, when you simulate this structure, sure. you assume each of these uh, squares is it as an average medium you simulate as a considering that you have a multi-layer of a stack of layers. It's both. Like both. Okay. That's right. In both cases will do. In other words, in some cases, for example, we consider this, you know, an effective epsilon. Oh, yeah. In other cases, we consider layered structures. We have done okay. both. Uh, yes. And my question is, uh, sure. when you, they are very close together, like yeah. the slide that you showed previously, yeah. uh, you do have some coupling between them. Absolutely. Them. Absolutely. That's an excellent point, by the way. This is something that electronics does not have. But do you still see it as a good thing? I mean, that, that, that will change. That will ch that's a good point. You have to take that into account, by the way. That's true. So what happens is that if I have an L and C putting next to each other, the electrons don't jump from this L into this C. Yeah, what I want to end up with is, uh, did you actually get to a point where you have uh, an optimal separation between these structures so you can control that? What, what we do sometimes is we put a very thin layer in our simulation. We put a thin layer of uh, dielectric, regular dielectric between them. That would reduce the SPP uh, generation between them. See, that's something that the regular electronics does not have. If I put an L and C next to each other, I don't have a wave between them. Okay. But in these structures, uh, if you design them you know, without paying attention to that, sometimes you may get a very tiny SPP. Uh, between them. But yeah. those tiny SPP, by the way, may not affect, depending on how you design them, may not affect the transfer function. In other words, there's still a band pass filter or low pass filter, whatever but you want. Say, uh, depending on the separation between them, you do have some, you know, like resonant behavior between, in, in, between this layer, too. You can. That That's right. You can. They change the, the, you know, the time constant. Of the yes. Layer. But you know, Andrew, what happens is that usually in those cases, if you're really looking at the realistic material with the loss there, those things would be actually die out. Usually, those very, very close coupling give you very high, uh, uh, I mean, high K wave number SPP. Those high K SPP, by the way, if you add a loss to them, they actually die out. I can show you, by the way, I have uh, several. I think that's because the res the, all of them have different resonances. Uh, exactly. Uh, frequencies uh, exactly. So uh, let me give you an example. I can show you m many results later in, in the break. But the, if I have, a, let's say, a block of epsilon 1 and block of epsilon 2 next to each other, and this acts as a Conduct, uh, inductor, this acts as a capacitor. Because one of them is positive, the other one negative, and you put them next to each other, you may have an SPP between them. Yes. That right. SPP, the wave number, depends very much on the relative value of epsilon 1 and epsilon 2. So what you can avoid is that you can actually design your particles with a different epsilon 1 and epsilon 2, but then you can change their width. So your L and C would not change, but the SPP between them will change. 
so you can reduce the effect of it. You have that degree of freedom. Because what you want effectively is you have the effective L and effective C. But that doesn't have to come from one single epsilon 1 or one single epsilon 2. Just one last question. If sure. I, uh, of course. Since you have a waveguide yeah. that goes that way, uh, and uh, in order for you to have different uh, behavior for each of these cells, I mean, yes. you probably have a stack of, I don't know, silicon nitride, yeah. mm -hmm. silver, or any kind of metal in, in parallel. And the other one, you think that should be, you know, perpendicular? It could be. One? It could be. But yes. Is that feasible? It it is. A, it's a tough. Probably it would be tough, you know, uh, uh, nanofabrication point of view. Yeah. That's right. So we prefer that the design both would be in the same direction of, of yeah, stratification. That's, that's what it would that would help. But sometimes there is no choice. I mean, sometimes you need a very high epsilon over here, and nature doesn't have it. So you have to stack them in that direction in order to get high epsilon. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, for example, you know, in, well, in the case of silicon nitride, we didn't have that problem because that was just nano wires and there was air gap between them. Uh, but we are, right now we are working on ITO, and then in the ITO, in the gap, we wanted to put some other materials there. Those materials, we want to make sure it doesn't give rise to the local SPP because we are, we are sending the wave in this direction and we want to have a transmission and reflection, not coupling to the SPP between them. And you can do that. For example, uh, for completely different projects, I have a collaboration with my good friend Albert Polman in Amsterdam, and there we are actually trying to experimentally show this issue of epsilon near zero. This is a different project than this. So we have electron beam in his lab coming through this structure, going through the metal, get to the waveguide. The problem is this electron beam hits the surface yes. of the uh, of the uh, silver. It creates SPP there, and that's an unwanted SPP until we get to the to the waveguide. So what he suggested is to put a very thin layer of chrome on top of that. When you put that, SPP dies out. The unwanted SPP dies out. But the one that we want would stay be there. In other words, the electron beam goes into the waveguide and create SPP inside that waveguide. I mean, that's a different geometry than this, of course. But there are ways that you can actually get rid of the S SPP that you don't want. We can talk more about this. Um, OK, John, how much time do I have? Uh, I mean, I know you guys are very kind, but I don't. <laughs> why, don't we, why don't we think about five more minutes? Mm -hmm. Then we can break, yeah. Sure. Okay. Sure. This, no, yeah, that's right, in a regular transistor. Now, N not here, is, yeah. not here, no. So, I guess the question, the larger question would be, in order to get functional circuit, do you need the same kinds of games in, uh, in uh, the optical system of the sort of metal product yeah, yeah. than you do? No, no. Uh, that's one of, the, one of the things that we are currently working on that, and I don't have a final answer to that. But, uh, no. I, we don't need to have that huge beta there, but we need to have beta reasonable enough that we can do that. Now, uh, this, that, that brings a very interesting point, by the way. There's a very interesting article by David Miller from Stanford. Uh, he, he wrote a very uh, uh, interesting article with regard to can we have you know, optical transistor? And was under what condition we can have optical transistor? It's a very generic article. And uh, he has a very interesting set of uh, check mark. And in, in other words, if anybody would like to have optical transistor, you better check these things. And one of the things he said, and I agree with him, is that at least the gain should be two. You don't want to have gain less than two. Obviously, gain should be greater than one. But the, uh, the, the higher, the better. But at least you have to have two. Why? Because one of the advantages of transistor is the fanning out. Electronics does that. You get a transistor and you fan it out. Now, you want to fan out to many, many branches. But at the very least, if you fan out in two, your gain has to be greater than two in order to sustain the circuit. If the gain is less than two, you cannot fan out. And if you cannot fan out, that transistor is not useful. So based on that, we are working in some combination to see that we would get it. But again, I don't have a result yet. So I, this is still work in progress. And I don't know how that will go. Hopefully soon, we will have one way or the other on that. So, uh, so let's move on and we finish it very quickly. So everything we talk about over here is kind of we learn from electronics, if you will, or inspired by electronics and we try to do in nanophotonics. But the road is both ways. 
Now let's see what we can do with what we learn in uh, nanophotonics or metatronics or whatever we want to call it. Let's see if we can, we can bring that back into the electronics and try to see whether we can change that one. So in that case, let's do this. In electronics, usually, as I mentioned, we deal with conductivity. But fortunately or unfortunately, this conductivity is usually just a simple positive quantity because of passive structures. But in photonics, we have an advantage that epsilon, because this is the displacement current, epsilon could be positive or negative. In fact, materials have epsilon positive or negative. That's a good thing to have. In electronics, unfortunately, we don't have that unless you make it an active medium. Uh, so positive. And then the same thing for this guy. So let's ask ourselves this wish list. Is it possible to have an electronic material in which sigma would also be positive or negative, but not the real part of it, because still I want to keep it passive. So in order to have a flexibility of being positive or negative, I have to have a complex sigma. And then I want to have a real part stay positive, because that relates to loss. I want to make it as small as possible. But the imaginary part doesn't have to be stay positive. It could be negative. And as my friend Masoud was mentioning, and next slide is going to show that, effectively that means this is epsilon. So that becomes I omega epsilon. That becomes conductivity. So, but do we have electronic material that would do this, not optical material? And the answer is yes. Uh, that material is graphene, which is already around. And uh, the graphene, by the way, which of course won the Nobel Prize in the year 2010 for two uh, of the people who, who uh, isolated graphene in the University of Manchester, it's a one atom thick structure. And this one atom thick structure, of course, quantum mechanically, you can calculate you know, the conductivity function of this. But the beauty of this is that that conductivity function can link into classical concept of the current and electric field and link to classical Maxwell's equation, as you will see in a few slides. The interesting point is that people in graphene, by the way, that directly work in electronics, majority of the work in graphene, if you look at thousands of papers, coming in graphene, majority of them on electronics. Only very few of them talk about the optical, I mean, pho pho photonic graphenes. And there are reasons for that. It's a very, very tough, uh, I mean, uh, experiments to have. But, the, but from our perspective, you know, as soon as I, uh, I, I, I was very interested, I started reading the papers, and I was reading the papers, I noticed nobody talks about this very simple observation, that J equal to sigma E is the same in circuit theory as admittance. So that sigma is effectively the admittance that we have. You know? And we know, by the way, because gra uh, conductivity is complex, and we know admittance is complex, there's a one-to-one -one beautiful correspondence that you see right there. That the real part of conductivity is conductance that we use in circuit. And the imaginary part of conductivity is susceptance. Now we know in circuit, this relates to the loss, and this relates to the stored energy. Which means, back to our old friend. So the imaginary part of conductivity of graphene relates to the inductor and capacitor. That's it. We have it right there. We have it naturally right there. We don't even need to make nanoparticles. It's right there. Nature has given us that. Nature has given us one atom thick inductor. One atom thick inductor. We can't have better than that. If we're talk about miniaturizations, you can't have anything even more miniaturized than that. One atom thick inductor or one atom thick capacitor, depending on the sign of this guy. But can this guy become positive or negative? Yes. In fact, if you look at the literature, there are many, many papers on the conductivity of graphene. This is one of them by George Hansen. So conductivity of graphene follows the very famous formula called Kubo's formula. And the Kubo's formula is quantum mechanical formula and depends on frequency depends on chemical potential. By the way, this mu is not permeability. This is chemical potential. That was basically the doping that you have there. Depends on the scattering of the electron, meaning loss, and depends on temperature. And it turns out if you plot this, it's a very, very interesting uh, dispersion, by the way. John, this was referring to what you were mentioning. So if you use the Kubo's formula, let's say in this paper, and you plot it, this is a real part of conductivity, and this is imaginary part of conductivity, at the 3 degrees Kelvin temperature, this is low temperature, and with the, with, the, with the electron scattering of this one, which is relatively moderate. I mean, there are some better scattering, there are actually worse scattering in the literature. Now, 
but I want to, uh, to, to walk you through this. This is at the chemical potential of 65 milli electron volt. One way to actually create that potential is you have a graphene and you put a ground plane and you put a DC voltage across that. So when you put a DC voltage across that, basically you, you electrically dope it so uh, the Fermi level would go up. They bring electrons into conduction band. Remember, graphene is a gapless semi-metal. So there is no band gap there. It brings the electron into the conduction band. And when you get an electron in the conduction band, it changes the conductivity. So at that level, which is basically is about you know, 20 volts, you put it across the graphene with the 300 nanometer, you notice something interesting. You notice the real part is very, very small. Of course, it has to be positive, obviously. Very, very small. And right around over here, it becomes noticeable. And this is at the region that actually photon absorption happens. And that's where the electrons can go from the con balance band to the conduction band. And as you increase the, uh, the uh, chemical potential, you bring the Fermi level up, you actually block this transition. What happens is this will move to the right. In other words, you become more and more, less lossy, if you will, at the, res at the frequency of interest. But the, another interesting feature is the fact that the imaginary part could have a negative value. So when it is positive imaginary part, that's equivalent of an inductor. When it's negative, that's equivalent to the negative inductor or capacitor. The beauty of this graphene, I think if you want to have one characteristic that's really better than anything else, is that it's tunable. It's easily tunable by just putting different voltage across that. So if you change the chemical potential by changing the voltage across this, you notice how nicely the conductivity will change. And you notice this actually becomes you know, less lossy. So this would shift to this. Now, you notice that in this plot, I intentionally plotted between 10 terahertz to 50 terahertz. 50 terahertz relates to 6 micron free space wavelength. 30 terahertz relates to 10 micron CO2 laser. You don't want to go higher frequency, because if you go to the shorter wavelength, optical phonons will get in, and the system becomes lossy. You don't want to do that. For many applications, you want to stay in this range. So, but the beauty of this is that if I fix my frequency and I just change the chemical potential, then the imaginary part could be negative, could be zero, could be positive. Let's see what we can do with that. So this is one atom thick circuit. If it's one atom thick circuit, why don't we envision something in the future like this? Imagine that you have one sheet of graphene, one single sheet of graphene, and imagine you can either dope it chemically or electrically, different segment of it differently. And what I put over here is the imaginary part of different set. The real part, I'm assuming all of them very small. So if I put different parts over here, if the imaginary part is positive, that's my inductor. If the imaginary part is negative, that's my capacitor. So effectively, I have a combination of inductors and capacitor. So if I put an electrode over here, you have a one atom thick filter. The beauty of that is that if you change the location of electron, you have a different filter. Like a stereo circuit that I was telling you, you know, a few minutes ago, but that was for the uh, three-dimensional collection of particles. Now we can do it in one atom thick structure. Well, this is just the idea. We haven't done this yet. But we are doing interesting simulations to prove the concept is possible. Now you might say, OK, how do I actually make different segment of it? different value. We have three proposals for that. But before I show you, by the way, let me show you one other interesting feature. Remember I showed you that this conductivity could look like, the imaginary part of it could look like this. So imagine, by the way, you choose a graphene that, the, uh, that this guy is positive, just to be shown in the previous slide. So effectively, graphene becomes this. Becomes a combination of inductors, and the coupling with free space is a capacitor. Now, Fred, what does this look like to you? Transmission line. So in transmission line, you can have a propagating wave. So what does it mean that actually graphene can act as a transmission line for electromagnetic wave? But transmission line that would pro a wave propagate over here with respect to free space, which means what? Which means you have surface wave. So you can have surface plasma polariton. Hugging this graphene and we'll go through this. Now, independent of this view, by the way, other authors before us, they actually theoretically showed that this is the case. 
So these three authors shown independently of each other before us, they showed that indeed it's possible to have a surface plasma polariton hugging this graphene and going through this. And in their calculation, they actually find the beta SPP. And beta SPP would be like this. Now, let's take a look at this. This is a very interesting beta. The regular SPP that you have in metal has a different dispersion. So let's walk through this. This is, this is of course, for free space. But you notice that the conductivity comes in the denominator of this guy, in the denominator. So if we operate at the frequency that the sigma real part is very small, but sigma imaginary is not, nevertheless, this denominator is very small compared to two. So approximately this dominates over one. So that means you effectively get this multiple. And this means the beta SPP is much larger than the free space beta. Much, much larger. So we decided to actually see what, what advantage that would have. So we started looking at the numbers. So if you look at the 30 terahertz and look at that, those numbers, you know, 3 degrees Kelvin, you know, all of those you put there, Kubo's formula, you find out that the beta SPP that you get is 70 times K0, which means that this SPP has a wavelength that is 70 times shorter. So if outside is 10 micron, this SPP would have a wavelength that's 144 nanometer. That's fascinating because one of the areas of plasmonics is to do what? Is to do sub-wavelength imaging, sub-wavelength everything. And for that, what we have to do is we have to come to the near field. Not here. We don't need to come in the near field. You can go any place on this graphene, as long as you have SPP, already the wavelength is shrunk 70 times. So you can actually detect the two particles that would land the SPP over two. And that means what? That means lambda 0 over 140 you would be able to detect on the graphene. Of course, there's a catch. You have to be on the graphene. So the question, of course, that this brings a challenge too, is how do I couple a plane wave into this? Then you have to have used a grating. Because if you actually send a plane wave into graphene, it will just go through. Almost, almost transparent. doesn't see anything. But if somehow you send a plane wave and you put some grating and couple this guy to the SPP, that SPP is a slow SPP. With a 70 times shorter wavelength. So what you see over here is the simulation of that SPP you have. Now, another thing I forgot to mention is that this SPP is only available when this imaginary part of conductivity is positive. If the imaginary part of conductivity is negative, we don't have SPP transverse magnetic. We have SPP transverse electric, and that's not that, much, that confined. So effectively, we don't have anything. Now, but I want to bring one other thing into account, and then I'll show a few examples, and we stop. Look at this beta SPP. It's 70 times K0. So if I have a wave that's called 70 times K0 over here, first of all, it's a slow wave. Secondly, the extent of the field in this direction is exponentially decaying exponentially decaying by e to the minus 70 times k0, almost. That is a huge confinement that you have over here. That confinement is about 20 nanometer above this and 20 nanometer below. So this SPP is highly confined to this. Now, if you use the uh, real part of this to find out how much loss you have, you find that the loss is not that bad, actually, because the real part was very small. And in our calculation, we find out that this SPP can propagate up to 15 Lando SPP. 15 Lando SPP, that's a lot. You know, we know, by the way, in the SPP on the metal, it doesn't go that far. This one goes 15 times Lando SPP. Now, Lando SPP is very small, granted. So still compared to Lando zero, it's not that much. But as long as you have SPP, 15 is a lot. And so what we said to ourselves, we said, okay, this would be a fascinating uh, pra platform for metal material. So why don't we do this? Why don't we just look at SPP and try to manipulate different segments of graphene in order to manipulate SPP? After all, what is metal material? Metal material is when you have a plane wave coming like this, and you have these inclusions, and you manipulate that plane wave. Now, we don't have a plane wave. We have this SPP, and we're going to manipulate this SPP. So we're going to have one atom thick metal material. It can be thinner than that. One atom thick metal material. So this is one example of that. So what we did over here, we assume in a single sheet of graphene, and we assume that it has two regions of conductivities over here with the two different dopings. 
And we choose the uh, chemical potential such that the conductivity has become this. If you look at the conductivity, you notice something interesting. Real part, very small. Imaginary part, not that small compared to this, but one of them positive, the other one negative. The positive one can support SPP. The negative one effectively cannot support SPP. Now, it does support TESPP, but TESPP is very weakly guided. So we said, what would happen if we launch SPP in one edge of this graphene and let this thing propagate until it gets to the region that cannot be supported. What happens to that SVP? That's what happens over here. So you launch this one. This is the top view of the graphene. You launch it over here. This region, the sigma i is positive. It supports SPP. And this line is the boundary between this region and this region. This one, S sigma i, is negative. It cannot support SPP over here. So this SPP come over here. Where does it have to go? Reflects back, like a Fresnel reflection. So you have a Fresnel reflection in one atom thick structure. So it, one atom thick structure guides the wave, hit that boundary, reflects back. It becomes like a mirror. But it's a mirror that's only one atom line. It reflects back. Now, why is it that it doesn't radiate away? It's an open, open space. Because this is highly confined. So radiation loss is very small. Very, very small. So the entire thing stays like this over here. So we said, OK, very good. So why don't we think about, instead of three-dimensional metamaterial, we think about two-dimensional, one-atom-thick metamaterial. The main question I haven't answered yet, how do I make these patches this way? We have three proposals. First, the one that everybody in electronics is already doing it, is that you have a, a highly doped silicon uh, substrate. You put a spacer of SiO2 over here. You put a graphene on top of it. You put a DC voltage over here. That will change the Fermi level over here. That would change the charge density over there. That would change the conductivity. And this voltage is very, very reasonable. I talked to my colleagues in chemistry, that they, uh, in physics, that work on, on graphene. They said, 23, very easy. We can do it. You can even go to about 100 volts across the 300 nanometer. Still doable. But you don't want to go above that, because then we have a breakdown, and so on. So in this case, you get this uh, chemical potential. Now, but this is not what I want. What I want is to have a different patches. This gives you only one patch. So one possibility is to have this way. So how about if we can have a ground plane that is uneven? If the ground plane is uneven and I put a voltage, DC voltage over here, the electric field would not be the same. If the electric field would not be the same, the chemical potential would not be the same. The charge density would not be the same. So it's beautiful. In other words, if you have a graphene like this and the ground plane is uneven, the conductivity of the graphene maps that ground plane without even touching it. So then you can actually have a map of this, uh, like, like, like a topographical map, but reflects itself into conductivity. Another way is just to put in on inhomogeneous space there, of course. Another way is to put a split gate. Split gate, people are already doing it for electronics. But the split gate, of course, is harder to have if you have more than two things there. Now, so this is a set of simulation we did <coughs> to show that you can have a lot of interesting fun devices you can think about. For example, here is one sheet of graphene that we are assuming in our simulation that the conductivity here is different than here. But we, we choose the conductivity such that it cannot support SPP here, but can support it only here. And we launch the wave from here. You notice the wave is trapped. Now, what does that remind you of? A waveguide. But it's only one atom thick. So it's the thinnest waveguide possible you can think of over here. And because there is not that much radiation loss, because it's highly confined, you can bend it. It still works. And in fact, this is a true simulation with the conductivity loss included. And you notice, as this thing goes, it actually dies out. And actually, this shows you that it's about you know, 15 SPP. Lando SPP it survives over here. Very nice. Now, you can have a splitter. You can have a combiner. You can have a many concept in microwave. With waveguide, you can bring it over here. But the thinnest possible. Now, so we are working on various different aspects of this. But let me share one other thing. If I can manipulate this wave, it means I can have a lens. If I can have a lens, I can do Fourier transforming. If I can do Fourier transforming, I can do optical signal processing. All of this in one atom thick. This is the simulation we have. 
So here we assume that there's this uh, one layer of graphene, but with this dent over here. This is not important, but what is really important is this conductivity is different. But if you choose the conductivity different that can support SPP on both of them, but different ends, if I launch SPP for, for over here, when it gets over here, it can focus over here. All of them, you know, on the plane. So in that case, if I show that I can have Fourier transforming, I can do signal processing. And this is the result of the simulation. If I start with the point, I can have a line. If I shift this point, I can have an oblique line. So that basically means delta function becomes constant. Delta function shifted becomes a phase variation. And that's Fourier transforming. If I can do Fourier transforming on one atom thick, and this is only about 20 nanometer up and down, so I can have a stack of these guys only 100 nanometers away from each other, that they don't talk to each other. So each layer can do different optical processing. So you can have a massively parallel, confined system of optical processor, all of them analog. Yes? You should expect that if you have this structure, the top, something drops. Excellent point. You can use the sensors. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. If, if you put something over here, clearly. That, so the, the, everything we know about metamaterial can, can be brought into one atom thick. Everything. Scattering, the sense, I, mean the, uh, I mean sensors and so on. Now with this technique can be brought into that. It seems that easier to do I, I don't know, by the way. Again, uh, this interesting, by the way, as I mentioned, when this paper came out, by the way, uh, two experimental groups that I know of, maybe there are more, but two, at least two experimental groups got very, very interested to try to actually experimentally prove that SPP does exist. Uh, one of them is, uh, I mean, uh, in San Diego, Dmitry Basov, and the other one in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Barcelona, in the Institute of Nanophotonics, Reinhold Hillerbrand and some of his colleagues are trying to do the experiment uh, to show whether indeed that would exist or not. But it's would be quite interesting, yes. Yes, 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 that's true. Invisible. No, I, I, because, because it becomes lossy. Yeah, yeah. Exactly right, exactly right. I mean, as far as I know, as far as we know with regard to the conductivity function, this still would be in the terahertz. By terahertz, I mean 30 terahertz. I mean, it's mid IR. It's a mid IR, yes. But still, I mean, that would be quite useful, even in mid IR. So, then we design actually a Lunenburg lens. So this Lunenburg lens basically is different path over here with different conductivity design such that, you know, when you start from here, it gradually change this one to uh, this. And uh, so you, you can have one atom thick scatter. We can have one atom thick antennas. Actually, we are working on that. So, so, in, uh, so this antenna becomes only one atom thick. The wave comes over here, scatters all of it, just like a flat land optics. You just stay in that pattern and everything we know about optics would go in that two-dimensional structure. So eventually one atom thick metamaterial. So this one, so we said, okay, okay, this is a graphene and imagine different segment of that has different conductivity. So this is not really a hole. This is entirely just graphene. It's just having different patch of conductivity varying there. As I said, after all, what is metamaterial? Metamaterial is basically a combination of inhomogeneous permittivity in three dimension. Now we're saying is inhomogeneous conductivity in two dimensions. So become closer to circuit. The circuit was three-dimensional conductivity variation. Yes. Yeah. This, by the way, all this simulation we have done, we have done it for freestanding, just for simplicity. But yes, we can put it on silicon. Yes, yes, you can do that. Absolutely, absolutely. You can have an inhomogeneous spacer. Yes, yes. There are many different ways to do that. I mean, it's not only one way. Um, okay, so let me stop over here. That's a different concept, but I use a lot of my time. That, that if you're interested later on, I can talk to you about that direction of the flow. That was the one that mentioned optical isolator. So, John, I think I stop over here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much.